Good morning, everybody. I say morning because I'm still in my kitchen enjoying a nice cup of coffee this morning for Read Aloud. Uh, so let's get started. This week we are on chapter six and let's see what happens. So this chapter is called Nina. Her name is Nina and five minutes into our conversation, I don't want her to leave either. She's smaller than me, but we're both 12. Her hair is straight and black. Mine is curly and red, but we both have a small gap between our front teeth. We watch the shooting stars and tell each other stories we've heard about them. Although I don't tell Nina the story about them being dead souls. I don't talk about death or why Nina is here at all. Nina has heard that shooting stars are celestial goats dragging their hooves when they run across the sky. Most of Nina's stories involve animals. We talk for hours, joining up stars into pictures and remembering tales of constellations named after tortoises, giraffes, scorpions, and snakes. But finally, the stars fade away and the sky blushes pink. Nina rises and takes a few steps away from the porch. Wait, where are you going? I reach for her arm, but of course my hand passes right through it. She stops anyway and stares out at the endless sand, eyebrows crinkled. I'm not sure, she whispers. I don't know where I am. There's nothing out there. I wave my hand at the desert. Stay here with me. My mind is thrumming with ideas. How she can hide in my room at night when the gate is open. And then we can spend time together in the day, talking, playing games. And when the house moves on, we can explore new landscapes together. I'm supposed to... I need to come and, and see my lamb, I say quickly. You have a lamb? He's an orphan. I'm hand-rearing him. I pick up the basket of dishes I dropped earlier and beckon Nina around to Benji's shelter on the back porch. I move him where, well, I move him there while I was cleaning my room yesterday and he fell asleep, snuggled into one of my old shawls. He wakes up when he hears us and squeezes his head through the gap near the rain barrel eager to be petted and for some milk. He's so cute, Nina smiles as she tickles Benji under the chin and he tries to lick her fingers. We used to have a camel, but my father sold him a few weeks ago. We moved to a new white house on the edge of the desert. Nina's smile widens as memories of her life flood back. There was a well and my father dug little channels to send the water over the ground. He planted figs, jojo jojoba, tiny orange trees, and mag magaria. He even planted oleanders because my mother loved the flowers so much. Her face darkens with sorrow. My mother, she got ill first, then my sisters, then me. Her eyes narrowed as she tries to remember. Why am I here? I drape my shawl around her like I've seen Baba do to the dead who don't want to pass through the gate. It's strange how my shawl can comfort her, but I can't touch her with my hands. Bubba says it's something to do with the house. It gives the dead energy for their journey, so they can seem almost real. They end up being lifelike in some ways, but not in others. And it varies between souls, and even from the moment to moment. Like how during the guidings, the dead can eat and drink, even though their bodies aren't really there but then they float weightlessly into the stars. I finish washing the dishes and stack them back in my basket to dry. Would you like some kasha, I ask? Porridge, I correct myself when Nina looks at me in confusion. Footsteps echo through the house. Bubba is awake. Shh, my fingers rush to my lips as the rest of my body freezes. Stay here with Benji, I'll bring some out for you, I whisper. The door creaks so loudly, I wonder if the house knows about Nina and is trying to give me away. I push it open quickly, my hands hot with annoyance. Every time I have a chance at friendship, the house tries to ruin it. You're up early, Bubba kisses my cheeks. I was uh, checking on the lamb. I look away, hoping she doesn't notice the blood rushing to my face. Can I eat my breakfast with him outside? It's such a lovely morning. Of course, Bubba smiles. It's nice to see you've cheered up a bit since yesterday. I nod guiltily and set about making a bottle for Benji and Kasha for me and Nina. I stir up a huge pan full of porridge, grate chocolate over the top, and sneak an extra spoon into my pocket. 
Nina and I eat with Benji on the back porch. I'm so glad I built a shelter for him in one of the house's deaf spots. If the house doesn't know about Nina, at least it can't hear us talking. Jack joins us, and as he sucks Kasha from my fingers, like he used to do when he was a chick, I tell Nina how I found and raised him. Do you have brothers and sisters? She asks. No, I shake my head. I just live here with my grandmother. My parents died when I was a baby. I have five sisters, Nina groans. There's never any peace and quiet. I'd like that. It's far too quiet around here. Nina stares into the distance, and she seems to fade slightly. I don't know how to get home to my sisters. Our house moves. I jump in brightly. Perhaps it can take you home. Really? Nina's eyebrows crinkle. Maybe. I turn to Jack, flushing with a lie. I don't think we'll stay here long, a week or two at most. Then the house will take us somewhere new. The jungle or the mountains or the seaside. You've seen the ocean? Her eyes light up. Of course. What's it like? She leans forward eagerly. It's like the desert in some ways. Endless water instead of endless sand. The waves move like the dunes, only faster. Salty spray stings your face like sand in the wind. But it must be so different too. Yeah, it's cool and fresh and wet, Nina suggests. Yeah, it's very wet, I laugh. Can you make your house go there next? I'd love to see the ocean. I wish I could. Maybe Nina would forget about wanting to go home if I showed her the ocean. The house decides where it goes, I admit, reluctantly. But it often goes to the coast. I rushed in as her face falls. Not long ago, it settled on a tiny island. The ocean was all around, as far as you could see. It changed color a hundred times a day. Depending on the sky and the light, waves washed onto the shore, knocking pebbles up and down on the beach. The dead, I stopped myself. The dead, she asks. I, I was going to say how the dead walked right across the surface of the ocean, but I think of another memory to cover my tracks. Lots of dead jellyfish washed up one day, all transparent and squiggly. Jack ate one and got sick. Jack ruffles his feathers and turns away. Silly bird, Nina laughs. He's lovely. You're so lucky to have a pet. He's not really a pet. He can take care of himself now. When he learned to fly, I thought he'd go away, but he always come back. I'm glad he does. Do you think he will stay with you forever now? She asks. I hope so. I look up at Jack and a lump forms in my throat. Nothing's forever. Everything moves on. The living, the dead, the house. I push the thought to the back of my mind and stand up. Would you like to check the fence with me? Nina nods, and I lead her to the far corner, out of sight of the house and its windows. I scan the perimeter to check one of the bones uh, have fallen. I tell Nina the fence is a tradition, like I told Benjamin. She looks at the skulls and shivers. None of our customs are as strange as this. For a moment, I see her fence. I see the fence and the house through Nina's eyes. Empty skulls balanced on bleached bones. Warped wooden walls leading to a twisted roof with a crooked chimney. The balustrade around the porch bends up and down at odd angles. And dry sand has been kicked into untidy piles where the house's legs have buried themselves. I think about Nina's description of her house. Clean and white, surrounded by the colors and scents of beautiful flowers. I see how my house must seem strange to her, frightening even. I turn my back to the house and clamber over the fence. Come on, I beckon to Nina. Let's go for a walk. As my feet hit the ground on the other side of the fence, a rush of excitement runs through me. Right now, I don't care about disobeying Bubba. I don't even care about the fact that I might get caught. All I can think about is the joy of escaping, even if it will only be for a little while. I kick off my shoes and let the sand flow between my toes as we walk from the house. A huge golden sun sits low on the horizon, warming the still air. Nina stops and crouches next to a small circular pit, no bigger than my palm. It's an antlion trap, she points at the center. Buried in there is an antlion, an insect with huge spiky jaws. It waits, hiding at the bottom for an ant to come along. And the ant just 
falls into the pit? I wonder why the ant wouldn't walk around it. It slips down the deep sides and the ant lion throws sand at it. The ant struggles to escape, but it can't. Mina's voice lowers dramatically and her fingers mime the struggle of the ant. It slides farther, pulled down by the sand, and eventually it reaches the ant lion's jaw. Mina's hands slap shut and she laughs. Do you want to watch it for a while? See if an ant comes along? We sit on the sand, staring at the trap. If an ant comes, shall we save it? You know, at the last minute, I ask. That's what my sister used to do, Nina smiles. You can if you want, but then the ant lion won't get its meal, you know? The ant lion is really a larva. If it eats enough, it changes into a beautiful dragonfly-like creature with four speckled wings and eyes that glow silver when it flies at dusk. Hmm, I'm not sure what to do now. I don't want to stop the ant lion becoming a beautiful dragonfly, but I don't want to watch the ant die either. I'm relieved when no ants come along. The sun climbs higher in the sky, and waves of heat shimmer on the horizon. It's too hot for ants now. They would fry on this sand before they even get to the lion trap. My heart sinks as I realize I'm not going to have to go back to the house for some shade. I sneak Nina into my bedroom while the house sleeps, and Bubba naps in front of the empty fireplace. A cool draft flows through the room as the chimney breast rises and falls, gently breathing in the air. The house might be old and strange, but at least it takes care of Bubba. I shut my door softly so as not to wake up either of them up. The window is open, heat flooding in. Jack sits on the sill, looking out across the desert, eyes half closed and wings slightly raised in the hope of catching a breeze. Nina and I sit on the floor below him, and I show her how to play checkers. And she teaches me a game where we have to guess what the other is thinking. I'm not very good at it, and I doze off in the heat while trying to think of an orange flower she has in her mind. When I wake, the air is soft and cool. Nina is staring out the window, the skull candles already lit. Throwing yellow light and dark shadows across the empty sand, I hear Bubba singing and preparing food for the dead. A weight falls across my chest, and I struggle to breathe. Nina shouldn't have to go through the gate if she doesn't want to, and I shouldn't have to lose another friend. The house is trying to control both of our lives. It's not fair. I draw my curtains to block Nina's view of the beckoning skulls, give her a book to read, and make her promise not to leave my room under any circumstances. But as I go to help Bubba prepare for the guiding, I can't shake an image from my mind of the gate opening and pulling Nina inside, like an ant being pulled into the ant lion trap. The thought of losing her makes my blood run cold, and I don't know how to stop it from happening, just like I don't know how to control my own destiny. That's it. Tune in for chapter seven.